21st. An online summit of arts and ideas on organizing 50 years after the death of Dr. Martin Luther King. I'm your host, Isis Sara Bay. I'm artistic director of the March on Washington Film Festival. April 3rd was the 50th anniversary of the death of Dr. King. And we know from the 1950s and 60s, the civil rights movement used a lot of different strategies and tactics to help move a nation toward racial justice. They did things like marches and sit-ins and voter registration drives and um, freedom rides. Uh, and so we wanted to talk about how effective those kinds of strategies are now 50 years later. Do they still work? Are there new things we need to employ to help move people to activism? So in this telesummit, we're talking to several people who are experts in their fields around this topic. And one of them is our guest for today. She's Leah Greenberg. She's the co-founder and co-executive director of Indivisible.org. She's a woman who knows her way around Capitol Hill, but more importantly, she knows how to activate and motivate people toward activism. Welcome, Leah. Thank you. It's great to be here. Lovely to have you. Let me scroll down to my questions. So we're talking about what the front lines are today and who the leaders are. But first, let's hear a little bit about Indivisible.org. How did it get started and why? Absolutely. Um, so my husband and I are formal, former congressional staffers. We worked in um, Cap on Capitol Hill during the early years of the Obama administration. Um, and so during that time, we saw uh, a really organized conservative local pushback to um, all of the great things that we were trying to do um, on the Democratic side, past healthcare, cap and trade, um, you know, a, a lot of different financial reform, et cetera. Um, and that was, a, that was a rough time for us. But immediately after the election of Donald Trump, we actually sort of went back to that period of time and started thinking that there might be some lessons there for, for us, for this broad wave of people who were activated by the election, who were looking for something um, they could do to resist Donald Trump. And so um, we thought, you know, our contribution, we were seeing these folks all over the country, um, people who hadn't previously considered themselves politically active, um, looking for any way that they could get involved. And we thought, you know, our contribution as former congressional staffers could be to demystify Congress and to give people a practical guide for um, replicating the kind of local organizing that can really have a dramatic effect on how your elected officials think. Um, because the point that we were trying to make to folks was Nothing that happens over the next four years happens just because of Donald Trump. It happens because your elected officials uh, let him do that or they fight back. Um, and you have powerful tools to actually change what they think is politically possible and, and change how they behave. So we put that guide online, um, just as a simple Google Doc, uh, in December of 2016. It was 23 pages long. It was full of typos. I had done the formatting. It was not a pretty document. Um, and we, uh, we figured that you know, our friends would read it, and um, it would get shared in a few Facebook groups, and maybe somebody would put it to use, and we'd hear about it like six months later. Um, but within a couple of hours, uh, the document was actually crashing because there were so many people in it um, oh. being shared all over the internet. Um, and suddenly people started to organize groups dedicated to actually putting that strategy into action. Um, and so we were suddenly getting you know, emails from all over the country, people saying, I'm forming a group to do this. Uh, I'm now Indivisible Columbus, or I'm now Indivisible Auburn, Alabama. And, um, you know, and we realized we needed to continue to support this wave of organizing that was happening all over the country. And that's how we got started. So what's the network now? How big is it? So there are now thousands of indivisible groups, at least one in every single congressional district in the country, um, an average of 13. And um, it's really, a, what's amazing about it has been, you know, the geographic breadth, um, the fact, the, the diversity of the different groups, the fact that they're, um, you know, they come from all over the place, um, they have different focuses, but everyone is really dedicated to local action to promote progressive values. So how do you stay in touch with the network and do you do training for people? We do. Um, so we stay in touch through a couple of different more formats. First, um, by email, our first and uh, always fastest way of reaching folks. Um, we have an email list for all of the folks who are leading groups around the country that we provide specialized information and resources for. Um, we have a network of organizers on our team now um, who have turfed up the country. They cover between two and five states each. 
and um, they're they're working directly with leaders around on the ground to coordinate, to provide support, to provide trainings. Um, we do trainings online uh, through through uh, digital trainings, and then we also have started bringing together leaders around the country for um, in-person convenings at a regional level. So when someone's thinking about forming a group, what are the top three things they should keep in mind? Well, um, I think it's, it's really pretty simple. Um, are you committed to taking action on a local level to um, promote your values? Uh, it's not, you know, we, we want to make sure that people don't feel like there's a high bar, high barrier to entry for um, taking your first steps to get politically active, because this isn't just about, you know, political professionals and no one else. Um, reclaiming sort of civic power is about everyone, and it's about everyone um, feeling like there's a place for them in that kind of activism. So I know that when we spoke before, you said, of course, having a vision for it and a commitment to it. And then you talk next about reaching out, which is what you did with your email, which you thought was just going to be with friends and family and really sparked a fire. And the third ingredient, so we have the commitment and then we make the effort to reach out to others. What takes it from a lovely thing we talk about on Facebook or email or social media into actually making some change? That's a great question. Um, I would say it's a few things. One is the power of community. I think that um, it's people coming together and having an impact that's greater than any one individual could come have a little, or have on their own. Um, and that's really, that's the power of organizing is it's turning, um, it's turning our collective desire for change into collective power. Um, I also think that, you know, we, we think about it in terms of how do you actually look at the incentives? How do you look at the power structure right now? And how do you actually apply your power in a way that affects those incentives? So, for example, a lot of the advocacy tools that we talk about are really about doing public advocacy in a way that um, targets some of the things that elected officials care the most about, which is their reputation, um, their brand in a district. Uh, whether or not they're perceived to be responsive, whether or not they're perceived to share the values of the folks that they represent. And so what we've said is if you're doing, you know, public activism in a way that forces them to respond, um, that's actually a really great way to make them take you into account whenever they're making decisions. It reminds me of um, during the civil rights movement uh, when the children were involved before the Children's March and there was some discussion around it and Dr. King and those around them were saying that once people, and television was involved in well, once people saw what was happening to young kids who were struggling and fighting for freedom, hopefully it would shift the feeling of people. So I see what you're saying about reputation and about people seeing the impact of what's happening in the world so that they can go ahead and make a, help make a difference. It makes, it's something, I remember with the uh, Vietnam War, seeing that on television on the news and we don't see a lot of that anymore. So um, it does make a difference. And I think that whole thing you're saying about community is also really vital. It's easy to feel that all of this is on the national level and I am just one person. But can you talk a bit about what happens when there's a power in community, in a local community? Have you noticed? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, first of all, um, the community starts to reinforce each other. Um, you start to hold each other up so that um, even, you know, the things that might feel overwhelming at a national level don't feel quite so overwhelming when you're together in a group and you're taking action. Um, I, you know, I hear a lot of concerns right now in this age where um, horrible things are happening on a daily basis coming out of the administration. People are, you know, they're exhausted, they're frightened, they're tired. Um, people I think are, the people who are active are often less tired than the folks who are uh, just reading the news every day. Um, because the people who are active have a sense of agency. They know that they're, you know, in their way contributing to this broader force that's pushing back and that ultimately can really make a difference. Yeah, agency, a really important word. It means that you have some capacity to do something about it and not just feel helpless. So let's talk about a couple of areas that I know that you have some focus on. What, uh, one is DACA and Clean Dream. Can you explain what those are and what the differences or similarities are? Sure, absolutely. Um, DACA, and I'm, I'm not an expert, but I'll, I'll give a quick overview yeah. for, um, the way that we've explained it. So um, DACA is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, and it's a program that was enacted by the Obama administration um, to ensure that 
uh, young immigrants who had come to this country um, and had grown up here in America and really never known anywhere but America as their home um, were protected and had the ability to come out of the shadows, uh, had the ability to work, had the ability to go to school, had the ability to be uh, the full part of American society that they should be um, under the, and were protected from deportation. Um, the Trump administration rescinded DACA in, uh, in the beginning of the uh, fall this year, or I'm sorry, 2017. Um, and ever since then, um, more than 800,000 people have been at risk of deportation. They're losing their ability to work. They're losing their ability to go to school. Um, it is a massive human tragedy, and it is completely, um, it is completely the, the product of an administration just being absolutely cruel uh, in pursuing and attempting to expel um, immigrants who belong here from this country. Um, and so what we've been pushing um, in response to that has been a legislative fix, the Clean Dream Act, um, which would pass a Dream Act, um, provide protections to these folks who've been um, at risk over the last several months, um, and ensure that they're actually, ensure that they have the futures here that they deserve. Um, Rep Democrats have supported uh, a Clean Dream Act. Republicans say they support it, but in practice, they're unwilling to actually bring that to the floor in Congress, um, which has been a very frustrating and disingenuous thing that they've been doing over the last several months. And so, um, and Trump, it sometimes says he supports it and says he doesn't um, because he like literally doesn't know what it is. Um, but in general, has usually come down on very hard uh, anti-immigrant positions whenever he actually is forced to take a full position. Um, so our network has been advocating for the Clean Dream Act over the last uh, over the last six six months since um, since DACA was rescinded, and we'll continue to advocate for it um, because we think it's really important. It's a it's a critical piece of ensuring um, that folks who are folks who are American um, are welcome here and have the ability to pursue the futures that they deserve. I just noticed something. Um, I was reading the news feeds this morning and saw that there was a memo issued from the. Uh, administration from the Justice Department um, tying job evaluations of immigrant immigration judges to the speed of deportation and it's to start taking effect in a few months uh, I know this just came over the news but what are your thoughts about that is that is that leveraging is it coercion is it incentive it seems a mixture of all of those things to me it does. I mean, it seems to me to be part of this broader trend that we're seeing across the administration of using every lever that they can to speed up the deportation use machine, um, to drive uh, immigrants back into the shadows, to make instill fear in communities, um, and to really just sort of re empower the, the worst and most dangerous parts of our government um, in service of a white supremacist agenda. Yes. So... I want to talk about the other piece of work that I'm, one of the other pieces of work I see that you do, which is around gun violence. So what is the work that you're doing on gun violence through the Indivisible Network? Um, that's a great question. So we are doing a couple of different things. Um, one of the things that we, Indivisible groups have really mobilized over the last month to support um, the wave of student organized gun violence um, work that is happening. So uh, many Indivisible groups were closely involved in organizing March for our lives, or marches for our lives in, in their respective communities, um, in building crowds for those marches. Um, in making sure that you know that could that could happen as successfully as possible, they're continuing to advocate to their elected officials on a state and local level, and also on a federal level for um, common sense gun policies. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing right now in Congress, because Republicans have the agenda setting power since they're the majority party, is um, there's very little chance that anything good will come to the floor on gun violence. Um, there's some chance that they'll actually move things that are uh, even further weakening protections against um, gun violence. So for example, concealed carry provisions, which would um, basically flatten all of the restrictions that states have placed on concealed carry. Um, and in fact, at the moment, they are actually attempting to confirm as a federal judge, one of the NRA's top lawyers. And so what we've tried to do is mobilize the network to make sure that those things can't happen um, and to push, push uh, elected officials to commit to uh, better policies going forward. Um, and then on the state and local level, that's the place where there's real potential right now for, um, you know, not just stopping bad stuff, but actually making a difference in um, getting to good policies. And so we've been producing resources for folks to understand how to plug in at a local level to actually um, start to empower that work to move forward. Part of what I'm trying to do through this Telesummit series is not only address uh, organizing and activism, but to ask some of the basic questions 
that seems to be underlying how we organize and how we become active. And so in this issue of uh, gun violence, why do you think, or how have you found it's, why is it so deeply ingrained and seems to hold on even in the face of more and more mass shootings? It seems logical on the one hand that something could and should be done, but as one of the uh, Parkland teenagers said, we are the generation of mass shootings. What a horrible thing to be able to say, but why is it such a fight? Um, I think that, you know, consistently over the years with gun violence, you've seen a situation where it's extremely popular to, or general common sense gun control protections are very popular, um, but there's a small minority of people who feel very, very strongly um, uh, in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the salience of that preference is such that uh, it's it's been able to capture one major party, uh, the Republican Party, and sort of basically prevent any kind of, uh, any kind of potential for reform being opened up at all within that party. Um, and so what we're seeing is, you know, the extremists within the NRA, within other gun rights organizations um, have really sort of calcified as part of this broader uh, right wing cultural push, this set of folks who really perceive themselves to be um, sort of under threat culturally across a variety of fronts. Um, and, you know, have come to fully identify with the Republican Party, have come to pose a challenge to anybody who crosses their line in primaries, um, and have just sort of made it such that change has been incredibly difficult to, um, to incentivize uh, at the political level. Where do you see signs of hope in the work that you're doing? Well, well I see, I mean, I see signs of hope even on the gun violence um, question in the fact that there is this broader cultural transformation that's happening. I think that the students in Parkland have done a really incredible job of shifting the debate because what they've done is to actually start to look at the, the corporate enablers of this work. Um, they started to really transform uh, the, the understanding of what, um, you know, sort of transform the, the degree to which people take this seriously, or people who've traditionally supported this, um, you know, consider it one of their top issues. Uh, and that's actually, that starts to push back on the trend that we've seen with the NRA, where uh, they can mobilize a small but very determined set of people to block any change. More broadly, um, in terms of my work, um, you know, we are, we're engaging on a daily basis with people who uh, may or may not have been politically active before Donald Trump was elected, um, but are, you know, discovering that they can actually have an impact in their community, whether that's on a congressional level, whether that's um, on a local sanctuary city resolution, whether that's um, electing, whether that's running for office themselves. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of people around the country uh, re-engage with the basics of, of civic engagement in a way that's really exciting and I think will build power for the long term to um, ultimately push back against these forces of darkness that have uh, taken, taken over in the country. When you're talking about it, one more question, as you were speaking, it made me think of something else. This uh, cultural transference or resurgence that's happening. You know, there's been an expression for years that when white America has a cold, black America has pneumonia. So we've been going through the violence, uh, gun violence against particularly young black men, but black people for quite some time. When things, when phones came of the form, we figured now once it's recorded, it'll be obvious to everyone. That doesn't seem to have abated it much at all. Mm -hmm. The gun violence in schools level, so we've had this ongoing issue of young people dying by gun violence, sometimes, most times at the hands of the police, but even just in general in cities. And now that after repeated times in schools, it seems that it's moving to the forefront. Do you find that people are able to make the same moral equival equivalency or correlation between the gun violence of police and young black men and the gun violence in schools? I think they should, and I think it's really important and a test for our movement whether we can articulate that connection in an intersectional way, because um, I think that what we've seen for too long has been that voices, um, voices uh, who have been doing really important violence prevention work um, in their communities haven't been part of the sort of what's traditionally considered the mainstream conversation on gun violence prevention. Um, and, and that's, you know, that reflects a, a lot of um, the trends of uh, sort of just failure to elevate the voices of folks who've been marginalized for a long time. And I think a failure to broadly recognize that the gun debate has always been a, a deeply racial debate. I mean, when we talk about, um, you know, the relationship between gun ownership and um, the right wing entities that are defending it right now, I think it's, you know, it's notable that um, 
they had nothing to say when Philando Castile, who was a gun owner in, um, who was yeah. a gun owner uh, with a, a legal permit, um, was shot by a policeman. Exactly. And, that's, and that's a reflection of the fact that, you know, a lot of the entities that define themselves as gun owner rights groups um, really sort of functionally perceive themselves as white gun owner rights groups mm -hmm. um, and sort of more broadly feed into a set of white um, grievance politics that we're seeing that have really, you know, come to the fore under Trump. Um, but we're always there. Yeah. And finally, do you feel that there is movement towards uh, indivisible or working with other organizations? Or because one of the things I think defeats our purpose is if we, even though even when we're active, we're moving in separate groups to get there. So that whole topic of intersectionality, I think, needs to happen within groups as well with Black Lives Matter and maybe ACLU and Indivisible and others. Do you see any joint work happening in this or are we still in silos around it? Absolutely. Um, on the ground around the country, we see uh, a, a whole variety of different partnerships, coalitions forming, um, ways that people are really knitting together different different groups that have evolved over, you know, some of them new, some of them really longstanding institutions, um, you know, from, from Black Lives Matter to the NAACP, um, from, you know, local immigrant rights organizations to the network of United We Dream chapters, um, from, you know, from groups like the ACLU and, you know, Planned Parenthood, other organizations that have um, an environmental groups. Um, I think what we're seeing across the across a lot of the progressive infrastructure is a reflection that we have to show up for each other and fight each other's battles because otherwise, um, you know, if we if we fail to do that, then we're um, we're allowing ourselves to be divided and we're allowing ourselves to uh, lose separately. Yeah, and indivisible is the word, right? So tell us how how can people get in contact with you or on their local level if they are now activated to become more organized? Um, well, go to our website. Um, down, we have a whole set of resources for you if you'd like to get started um, organizing a group or if you'd like to join a local group. We have a map and a directory of local groups in your area. Um, so check out when, you know, if you can find a local group, check out when their next meeting is and, and just show up. Um, or join our, you know, join our email list, um, and we'll be keeping you updated with actions you can take on a regular basis to um, to stand up to this administration and to push for progressive policies. Leah Greenberg, Indivisible.org. Thank you so much for joining us on Legacy Twenty First. Thank you. Honored to be here.